Hello Year 11s and welcome to this video on negligence. There are three things that you need to do while you're watching this video. The first thing is to take the very best Cornell notes that you can. The second thing is to use the pause and rewind functions. Use the pause function if you need to stop this video to take notes. Use the rewind function if you need to go over any information contained in this video. And the third thing that you need to do is to have your vocabulary sheets open in front of you so that you can write into your vocabulary sheets the definitions of key terms or of any other words the meaning of which you may be unfamiliar with. Once you've finished watching this video, please read the pages from the textbook referred to on this slide. And if you find any additional information from your reading that you think is useful, then supplement your Cornell notes with that information. Well, let's get started then. On this slide, I've set out your two learning intentions. Make sure that you write these learning intentions down in your Cornell notes. Your first learning intention is that you should be able to describe the elements of negligence. I will provide you with the information that you need to satisfy this first learning intention in this video. Your second learning intention is that you should be able to apply this knowledge to a hypothetical case to determine whether the case is one of negligence. In class, we'll be doing a number of learning activities which will require you to apply the information from this video to different case studies, with the aim of determining whether the case is one of negligence. This will help you to achieve this second learning intention. Negligence is a tort which involves a breach of a duty of care by a defendant that causes loss to a plaintiff. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term negligence and write this definition in there. A tort is just an old-fashioned word for a type of civil wrong. Breach, causation and loss are three of the important concepts in civil law that we looked at in the previous video on key concepts of civil law. In this video, we will be looking at how each of these concepts applies in the context of the law of negligence. For a plaintiff's claim for negligence to be upheld against a defendant, the plaintiff must prove three things on the balance of probabilities. These three things are the three elements of negligence. The first element that the plaintiff must prove is that the defendant owes a duty of care to the plaintiff. The second element that the plaintiff must prove is that the defendant has done or failed to do something that breaches the duty of care that the defendant owes to the plaintiff. And the third element that the plaintiff must prove is that the breach of the duty of care that the defendant owes to the plaintiff caused the plaintiff to suffer loss. In the rest of this video, we'll be looking at each of these three elements in more detail. But first, a word of warning. Loss is sometimes referred to as damage. Be careful not to confuse damage with damages. If the plaintiff proves that the defendant has been negligent, then the defendant must pay an amount of damages, that is compensation, to the plaintiff, which is sufficient to return the plaintiff to the position they were in before the plaintiff was affected by the defendant's negligence. So damage is loss that the plaintiff has suffered, whereas damages is compensation that the defendant must pay the plaintiff for loss that has been caused by the defendant to the plaintiff. The first element of negligence is that the defendant must owe a duty of care to the plaintiff. A person, X, owes a duty of care to another person, Y, if it is reasonably foreseeable that what X does, or fails to do, will cause loss to Y. Something is reasonably foreseeable if it is predictable. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term duty of care, and write this definition in there. Once you've done that, please highlight the words in red bold type, that is, the words reasonably foreseeable. 
On this slide, I've set out a number of examples of where one person owes a duty of care to another person. A teacher owes a duty of care to a student. This is because a teacher is responsible for teaching a student, and if the teacher doesn't teach the student properly, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that the student will suffer loss. For example, if I taught you the wrong curriculum, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that you would suffer loss by failing your end of year exams. A doctor or nurse owes a duty of care to their patient. This is because a doctor or nurse is responsible for looking after their patient, and if the doctor or nurse doesn't look after their patient properly, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that the patient will suffer loss. Uh, for example, if the doctor or nurse gives the patient a medicine that the patient is allergic to, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that the patient will suffer loss by having an allergic reaction, which might, for example, cause the patient to suffer brain damage. A motor car driver owes a duty of care to other road users. This is because if a motorist drives in an irresponsible manner, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that another road user will suffer loss. Uh, for example, if a motorist speeds through a school zone at 8.30 on a school morning at 70 kilometres an hour, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that a school student who is crossing the road will suffer loss by being hit by the motorist and, for example, breaking their bones. And a manufacturer owes a duty of care to a consumer, that is a person who uses the goods that are made by the manufacturer. This is because a manufacturer is responsible for the quality of the goods that they make, and if the manufacturer makes defective goods, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that a person who uses those goods will suffer loss. Uh, for example, if a ginger beer manufacturer doesn't wash the ginger beer bottles properly before filling them with ginger beer, then it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that a person who drinks that ginger beer will suffer loss as a result of the ginger beer bottle being contaminated and the consumer therefore falling ill. Of course, this was the case in Donoghue and Stevenson, where a snail crawled into one of the ginger beer bottles and the plaintiff, Miss Donoghue, uh, suffered uh, from severe gastroenteritis as a result of swallowing part of the snail. Now, these are only some examples of where a defendant owes a duty of care to a plaintiff. In each case, the defendant will owe the plaintiff a duty of care if it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that what the defendant does or fails to do will cause loss to the plaintiff. Let's now look at a real life case. Take a moment to pause the video and to read the newspaper article on this slide. This is a case where a mother, Oslam Yaman, and her 10-year-old daughter, Azri Yaman, went to the reject shop and bought a packet of SpongeBob SquarePants biscuits. When Azra opened the packet, she discovered a dead mouse in the biscuits. Both the mother and the daughter suffered psychological injuries from seeing the dead mouse in the biscuits, and so they sued the reject shop for negligence. Now remember that the first element of negligence that these two plaintiffs will need to prove is that the reject shop, as the defendant, owed them a duty of care. A defendant will owe a duty of care to a plaintiff if it is reasonably foreseeable that what the defendant does or fails to do will cause loss to the plaintiff. In this case, the plaintiffs would argue that a retailer owes a duty of care to its customers not to sell them contaminated food because it is reasonably foreseeable, that is predictable, that if a retailer sells contaminated food to a customer, then that customer will become sick. Note that we describe the duty of care in general terms rather than in specific terms, that is, in terms that are specific to the particular case we're looking at. We don't say that it is reasonably foreseeable that if the reject shop sold biscuits with a dead mouse in them to the Yamans, then the Yamans would suffer psychological injuries.
Instead, we say that it is reasonably foreseeable that if a retailer sells contaminated food to a customer, then that customer will become sick. It is because a retailer owes a duty of care to its customers not to sell them contaminated food that we can say that in this case, the reject shop as the defendant owes a duty of care to the Yamans as the plaintiffs not to sell them contaminated food. This brings us to the second element of negligence. This element is that the defendant must have done or failed to do something that breaches the duty of care that the defendant owes to the plaintiff. A person X breaches a duty of care that X owes to another person Y if X fails to do what a reasonable person would have done. In deciding what a reasonable person would have done, there are a number of factors that you could consider. Some of these factors are included on this slide. Let's briefly go through them. The first factor is the likely risk of harm. If the risk of harm is very high, then a reasonable person would do more to reduce that risk than if the risk of harm was very low. For example, in a factory where there's lots of dangerous machinery, the risk of a factory worker hurting themselves is so high that a reasonable factory owner would install safety guards around the machines. The second factor is the likely seriousness of harm. If the harm is likely to be very serious, then a reasonable person would do more to prevent the harm happening than if the harm is likely to be minor. Uh, for example, the harm to airline passengers from a plane crashing is so serious, the passengers are likely to die, that a reasonable airline would take extra special care in maintaining and checking its aircraft for defects. And the third factor is the difficulty and cost of avoiding harm. If it is easy and inexpensive to implement measures um, to avoid the harm, then a reasonable person would be expected to put in place measures to avoid that harm. Uh, for example, if a jetty runs out into shallow water, it is very easy and inexpensive to put up a sign warning people not to dive from the jetty into the water. And so a reasonable local council would put up such a sign. Let's come back to our mouse in the biscuit case. Remember that the second element of negligence that the two plaintiffs, Oslam and Azra uh, Yaman, would need to prove is that the reject shop, as the defendant, breached the duty of care that the reject shop owed them not to sell them contaminated food. A defendant will have breached its duty of care if the defendant fails to do what a reasonable person would have done. In this case, the plaintiffs would argue that the reject shop breached its duty of care to the Yamans because a reasonable retailer would have checked the biscuit packaging to ensure that it was not damaged, so that the biscuits couldn't be contaminated by something like a mouse crawling into the package and dying. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the reject shop actually breached its duty of care or that the mouse crawled into the packaging because it was damaged. This is just the hypothesis that I'm using to analyse this case as one of negligence. Note that when we are looking at whether a defendant has breached a duty of care that the defendant owes to a plaintiff, the focus is on what a reasonable person in the position of the defendant would or would not have done. It would be reasonable for a retailer to have checked the biscuit packaging for damage because this could be done easily and inexpensively. Because the risk of a customer becoming sick as a result of contamination where the packaging has been damaged is high. And because um, that illness could be a quite serious one, for example, as where the customer gets gastroenteritis. We now come to the third and final element of negligence. This element is that the breach of the duty of care that the defendant owes to the plaintiff must have caused loss to the plaintiff. 
As we saw from the previous video on key concepts of civil law, a defendant will cause a plaintiff loss where the plaintiff suffers the loss because of something the defendant did or omitted to do. Conversely, if it's not the defendant but an intervening event that causes the plaintiff's loss, then the defendant will not have caused the plaintiff's loss. In such a case, the defendant would not be liable to the plaintiff for negligence. Uh, for example, suppose that a skydiving company breaches its duty of care to a skydiver by providing the skydiver with a defective helmet. In that case, if the skydiver puts the helmet on and that helmet breaks when the skydiver hits the ground, with the result that the skydiver suffers a fractured skull, then the skydiving company will have caused the skydiver's loss, that is the fractured skull. However, suppose that after jumping from the plane, the skydiver's parachute ropes become tangled and the skydiver plummets to the ground in a fall that breaks the skydiver's back. In that case, the skydiving company has breached the duty of care that it owes to the skydiver by providing the skydiver with a defective helmet. But that breach of duty was not the cause of the skydiver's loss, that is, the skydiver's broken back. Instead, the cause of the skydiver's loss, that is, the skydiver's broken back, was the parachute ropes becoming tangled up. As you'll also recall from the previous video on key concepts of civil law, the loss that a plaintiff suffers um, as a result of a defendant's negligence can take many different forms. This loss could be economic or financial loss, property damage, personal injury, pain and suffering, or loss of amenity, also known as loss of enjoyment of life. Back to our mouse in the biscuit case. Remember that the third element of negligence that the two plaintiffs, Oslam and Azra Yaman, will need to prove is that the breach by the reject shop of its duty of care not to sell them contaminated food caused them to suffer loss. For a defendant to be liable to a plaintiff for negligence, the defendant must have caused loss to the plaintiff. In this case, the uh, plaintiff's argument could be that because the reject shop did not check to see if the biscuit packaging was damaged, the Yamans suffered loss, that is, that the cause of their loss was the failure by the reject shop to check to see if the biscuit packaging was damaged. Again, note that I'm not suggesting that the reject shop did not actually check the biscuit packaging. This is just the hypothesis that I'm using to analyze this case as one of negligence. The losses that the plaintiffs are claiming to have suffered um, are psychological injuries, including post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. These are all forms of personal injury. There may well be other losses that they could have suffered. Uh, for example, uh, they might have suffered economic or financial losses, as where the mother has been so traumatized that she can no longer go out to work. Or uh, they may have suffered um, loss of amenity, uh, for instance, as where Azra can no longer bear to eat biscuits because of the experience that she's had with the SpongeBob SquarePants biscuits. As you should remember from the previous video on key concepts of civil law, Parliament has passed laws which specify the time within which a plaintiff may bring a civil action against a defendant. These time limits vary depending on the type of civil action. In Victoria, the law that sets out these time limits is the Limitation of Actions Act 1958. If a plaintiff brings a civil claim against a defendant after the applicable time limit has expired, then the defendant can raise a defence that the claim is out of time or time barred, so that the plaintiff's claim cannot proceed. We've seen that the reason for these time limitations is to provide uh, certainty for defendants, to address the problem that evidence may become less reliable over time, for example, because witnesses forget what they saw or heard, and because social cohesion requires that disputes are resolved as quickly as possible. 
On this slide, I've set out the time limits that apply to different types of negligence claims. The general rule is that a plaintiff has six years within which to bring a negligence claim against a defendant. However, this time may be longer where the injury is not so obvious. Uh, this might be the case where, for example, uh, it is a disease or injury that does not develop for some time, or where it is an injury that is not discovered for some time. Well, this brings us to the end of this video. As a result of watching and taking notes on this video, you should be able to describe the three elements of negligence. In addition, once you've completed the learning activities in class, you should then be able to apply the knowledge that you've learned from this video to a hypothetical case to determine whether the case is one of negligence. Don't forget to read the pages from the textbook referred to on the first slide. And if you find any additional information from that reading that you think is useful, please supplement your Cornell notes with that additional information. Thank you for your attention.